The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, welcome to the second uh, lecture in the CDD Spring Forum here at MIT, Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, sensing place, photography is inquiry. And uh, before I introduce our speaker for tonight, Camilo Vergara, I want to remind you all uh, that Lou Watts will be speaking next week. Lou is a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, taught at Berkeley for many years. And he will be speaking on communities of color, traces of history and culture, about his search tracing uh, in both rural communities and urban communities um, the roots of African American uh, history and culture. I first, uh, I've known Camilo Vergara's work for some time since his book, uh, The New American Ghetto, was published, but I had the pleasure of meeting him just after American Ruins had come out in 1999 at a conference at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And uh, we pored over his book and um, it turned out Camilo had a rental car and was planning on going in shooting photographs in Detroit, in Detroit uh, at the end of the conference. So um, we hooked up and uh, took a field trip into uh, Detroit, into the, uh, the train station and the old Packard plant and uh, really um, uh, some e e extraordinary uh, places. Camilo has been photographing many different American cities for uh, decades, uh, in some cases from the same place, coming back to the same street corner or to the same rooftop, looking down uh, on the same scene, and photographing uh, the changes over time in Camden, New Jersey, in Philadelphia, in New York City, in Chicago, in Detroit, um, and uh, numerous other cities across the country. He's won um, many awards. Most recently, he uh, was appointed a MacArthur Fellow and uh, has many books. So if you get intrigued and introduced to his photography here tonight, um, you can uh, see we have a, the new edition of American Ruins up here on the table, which you can take a look at afterwards. Um, I won't go on and on anymore. Camille lives in New York, and he'll tell you more about what he does and how he goes about doing it and why. Uh, his background, by the way, is as a sociologist. Mm. Well, Camille. It's a great pleasure. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy to be here. This is my second time here. I was invited uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, I spoke there was somebody teaching urban studies here that had run for mayor of Boston a couple of times. His name was Mel King. And uh, he, he taught a course in urban history here, or urban studies. And there were two students who, I don't know where they had found out what I was doing. I don't think my book was out at that time, but I was doing some articles on different pieces, and I think something had come out in The Nation or something. And one of the students called Berg, call me. And I spoke, I will never forget, because it was like an amphitheater. And it was all packed, and there were students standing up in the back. And, and, uh, and it was, you know, almost like an operating room, except that it didn't have a cadaver there in front of me. Uh, and it was a very exciting thing. I just, I was tongue-tied, more than I am now. And uh, but it was a receptive crowd, and it was a, it was a great moment for me. So I, I have very fond memories, and uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to be invited here. Uh, I will briefly try to set up this, uh, this uh, idea, this website of mine, and, and what I'm trying to do. Uh, I... Uh, uh, 
what I was trying to do is what I used to see one of my professors at Columbia do. He would take a hand like this and he says, here, put the two hands together. And then you make an image of it, an impression. So how do you take a city and you, through pictures, you make an impression so that that city is reflected in the images that you take? Uh, you realize that most images that make it into the history books or make it into the planning books, you know, the, the different sources that they come out, they are either, you know, from the city archives, they are either from union archives, they are from, from the newspapers most, use, most often, and they have to do with events so that they don't, the they, they city, the way the way cities happen, the way the, the, their ordinary life, the way street lays down, is not something of interest. Uh, oftentimes, when it, when it was of interest was when the city was first built. So you wanted to show how the main street was growing. And oftentimes you use time-lapse pictures. I remember one time researching this and finding out Brazilian cities. And I had time-lapse pictures of streets of Brazilian cities that showed you know, how, how the developers were, uh, how the city was growing and becoming, in fact, larger and larger and larger. So photography was on the side of progress and growth. And uh, my interest has always been just this process uh, of, of, of the decline of the American cities. What happens to the, to the physical uh, city as capital gets pulled out, as jobs get pulled out, as, and, and, and not replaced? At one time, for a number of years, it was the government that would uh, step in and then all kinds of programs would be created, which then in turn would change the shape of the city. But uh, more recently, the government has pulled out. And one of the ways in which you can see it, if you take some of the, the uh, most popular, or most famous, or better, if, if, if I could say so, uh, urban uh, history books, and you look by times, you know, the times to which they go. If the books are more recent, if the books cover the last, uh, the last 10 years or so, uh, you look for the, in the index for the number of times state and, and, and federal government shows up. And you see that the number is much smaller than what it was for books that deal with an earlier period. So, with that said, uh, as a photographer, um, there are many photographers that have photographed poverty. Poverty being a separate thing that photographing a city. Poverty just tends, the photography of poverty tends to concentrate on the idea of a person, a person who happens to be destitute. That never appealed to me because Human beings don't change very much. I mean, they change in terms of the clothes that they wear, but you know, if it's seeing a poor person from the 19th century and seeing a poor person from the 20th century, something very similar. What really interested me was the background of poverty. What was behind this? What was behind, what was behind people? And then the environment in which they live, because that has changed, that, that goes from, uh, 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 changed very dramatically. I mean, for those of you who uh, used to be familiar with the high-rise projects, you know, you can go to a city like Chicago today and look for those high-rises that were stretched for, uh, in the case of the Taylor Homes, for about two miles and probably you find one or two examples left, you know, where there were 40 or 50 big towers standing up. So, it's this landscape that I intend to, uh, I have documented and I intend to present to you today. And what I have done, uh, what, what I, the way, the form I tr I'm trying to present it is by showing you photographs of the city of Camden, which is a, a city that I have photographed since, the, since 1979. 
This has done with support with the Ford Foundation and working together under the sponsorship of Rutgers University, who happens to have a, ca a campus in Camden, in association with a historian of Camden whose name is uh, <clears throat> Howard Gillette. And he's just uh, completed a book called Camden After the Fall. And he's done a very concise introduction to the website where you can you get the major figures and the major changes that Camden has gone through. Uh, Camden, uh, the Camden website is invinciblecities.com. And the invincible cities comes from the fact that Walt Whitman used to live in the city. He died there in 1880. And his house is still there. And his great, his, his his uh, mausoleum is still there, and you will see it in the pictures. So what I like to do is to start with the picture, with the photographs, show you the photographs relatively quickly, and then, if possible, to open up for questions. Because I I found that in several places where I have given this presentation, the questions at the end after the presentations become uh, much more. Uh, the, the, it be, the whole thing becomes much, uh, much more interesting. So we start with a photograph of the inside of a factory. Now what, do you will see four or five like this in the website. And what was very interesting is that this was a chemical plant. It's, and this chemical plant called Hollingshead uh, in Camden uh, became for someone like a little art gallery. And in this little art gallery, I selected this eye to, to open the website. It's like the eye of the photographer, but it's the eye of the photographer within a factory window. And it, the idea of deindustrialization and the post-industrial city sort of come together in some way. Let me just see. I started taking pictures of Camden, and this has been my policy since the, the very beginning of, of, uh, of, uh, of this attempt at getting a replica of a city. It's, it's whenever there is a high point of view, I make a, an effort to go to the roof every time I go to that city. And this has been my perch. So year after year after year, I would go to this building, which was a building that was built in, in North Camden for the purpose of providing a different type of housing and a better type of housing and a more secure type of housing to the people who lived in those row houses that you see below. So the idea was to keep the people in Camden and to stop them from going out. So I did that I went to that building, to that same corner. You see the largest grocery store in North Camden. It's right on the, at, uh, it's, it's right here where I'm pointing. Uh, it's still there. The house has disappeared. They built uh, some new, new housing was built by the river. The river is the Delaware River. And the center the center part of the photograph that's almost all disappeared. Camden lost about 40,000 inhabitants and now has a little under 80,000 people living there. Uh, North Camden was a very, very uh, densely populated area of Camden and there were factories all around the place. You could walk from here and work in a place called RCA, which during the work, during the war, employed as many as 25,000 people in something like 20 buildings. And you're going to see one of the buildings was saved. And you'll see it at the end of the presentation. So you see that there is some new housing being built, but much many more are, are disappearing from that central area. Uh, let me just see. That's the last of the series. The river in the back is a Delaware. That's the one that Washington crossed. And uh, we talk about images as a source of discovery. This is the house that was standing right in the middle of the picture that we saw before. 
And what you see there is something that, uh, that I had never seen before, and that is that children would go out, and I saw this more than once, uh, and there was an abandoned house, and there was bricks that are falling, so that, you know, maybe because there's no, there was no place to play, maybe there was no gym, no, pl no other place, so one of the sports, one of the games, that 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 was there was throwing uh, bricks at a standing block, at a standing wall, until the wall actually collapsed. And I thought this is part of my idea of the knowledge that you can acquire about the city. That unless you live there for a long time and unless you take notes it will always elude you if you deal with secondary material, it would never get recorded, is that there is, if, if, if you were to take the time and to look systematically, you would find a whole series of, of activities that you won't see anywhere else, and this was one of them. So how a, a street, many of these images, I have taken them year after year after year, I could show you this, uh, 15 times taking over a 50, uh, over a 20 some year period. The first picture is in 1979. Uh, what I found, you know, sort of mesmerizing was the idea that a city could disappear. You know, is that is that, uh, here the city is more or less complete. Some of the houses are boarded up, and there uh, the first picture is 79. The second picture is in 88. Uh, and then what I found that I uh, also very peculiar and interesting about Camden was I, was that the the sign that you see that says danger Hargrove demolition uh, that this uh, sign was everywhere and then I found out that he had a website and on the website there was a claim to have demolished as many as 5,000 buildings in Camden. And then the, 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 I came to the realization that instead, in the city of Camden, instead of having a master builder, like we did have in New York with Robert Moses, we had master M builders. And maybe in, the, in other cities that have suffered and have been taken down so much as, as, as Camden, uh, I don't know if it was just one person or one company that, that, that has done most of Detroit. It's probably more than that. But I think this whole process of taking a city down, it's almost as interesting as a process of building a city. And I think it's also a process that's worth studying because, uh, and here is something that impressed me very much and came to my attention a few months ago, it was a, a report that, uh, that that came out of Funny May, I think, and it was written up in one of their publications about what were the ten most important forces acting on the American city uh, up to the year 2000, and what were the most important factors that were going to be present in the American city uh, for the next 50 years. And one of them, in which a group of 150 historians and planners and so on uh, agreed on overwhelmingly, I mean, it wasn't like 50-50 or divided, it was that uh, we were going to have a permanent underclass, and they used the word permanent underclass. Well, if we have a permanent underclass, we're going to have permanent Camdens. <laughs> I'm just so, it happens to me all the time. And uh, uh, if we're going to have a, a permanent Camdens, we may as well get to know them because they are part of what the country is all about and they are part of, uh, of, of the history of the country. And, uh, and I also think uh, in some way, and in most of us, although, you know, it's, it's this, this, this sort of thought is very discouraging, this idea of permanence. I think in most of us, there's still an idea that, that these extremes of poverty don't need to exist. Most of all in a city, in a country as rich as the United States. 
But that has been said too much. That picture was taken in 96, and that's what the block looks like right now. Uh, the pink house on the right was uh, of a lady that you see here, and she uh, happened to be very secure, and, uh, and she had this very nice apartment right there on that block where everything was collapsing. And one time I asked her how, and she said, well, there are four Latino policemen in the, in the Camden police force, and, four of them, and the four of them are nephews of mine. So, so they would take a break and come and have a cup of coffee with her, and so everybody left her alone. She died very recently. That was one of the most important corners in Camden. The street was called Broadway. There were big theaters right there across the street, and uh, uh, this, is, this is in decline. The year was 1981. The next uh, uh, photograph was just taken. So this is the process, the dismantling, the, the taking down of the buildings. And that's a view of the same building uh, with a person that's waiting for the bus. But it sort of reminded me of the views of ancient Rome, where you had the, the, the shepherds uh, in front of the Colosseum or some of the classical buildings, and and uh, and there was this that disparity of of uh, of uh, lives and 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 uh, you know the context in where they were placed. Uh, over the years, I've seen the effort. It's, the bank is now a church, and I have seen the effort that the church has had to go through to be able to paint that immense building. So it took them like five years to do one side, and then they tried to do the other side, the main street side, and they still haven't gotten to the top. The, the buildings, areas become adapted. Like this is the end of the sort of normal state of this corner of Broadway. When it was before, it, it, it's, it's one of those corners that typically got killed by the malls. And there was a mall in Camden called the Cherry Hill Mall that attracted most of the businesses that were in, on Broadway. So that the appliances and television stores went over to the mall, and the hat shop that's next door, maybe they did there's no hat shops anymore, and the drugs and all of that uh, went there. And now the area became, that's what it is today, the first one was in 79. Today it became more a sort of center for people who are down and out. So this is, has become the area where you find most of the shelters, most of the, it's, it could be compared to actually to a repair station for human beings, you know, a place where you go uh, when you don't have anywhere to stay, a place where you go when you're battered, battered or, or a place where you go when, uh, when you have addictions. Again, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, empty lots, sometimes you see these creations that develop sort of uh, one piece at a time. And what this is, is a local Catholic church that went to one of the empty lots and put a cross there, you know, so, as <laughs> now that we don't have the state and the federal government to help us, we have to go to a higher power. And so they put this there, and then other people begin to bring their, their, their benches and their uh, tire planters, and it becomes kind of a little uh, sacred space that I continue to keep under observation. Uh, that's the church. Uh, it's, of course, the last of the row houses on this block, and probably the only one. And there you can see how it's this, the stoop that leads to the, the, that leads up. It's also used to lead to the house next to it. Again, another church. They, there's no shortage of churches in Camden. They, it's very cheap to get a building that you can uh, habilitate and put a church in. It's also uh, a, a, the city is very insecure. Camden has, for two years in a row, was declared to be the most dangerous city in America. 
So uh, you can see here that, uh, that people don't take chances with windows and that sort of thing. This is an old church. This was back in 81 and it doesn't exist anymore. And there was a garage and I went to service there. You, it's a very, very long building and you could see about 80 people inside of there. It's another one. And that's the back of yet another church. Uh, as you can see, I mean, the tragedy with the buildings like this, of course, if there is a fire and people have to try to get out of it. And that's the last of uh, an industrial neighborhood that was very ne near the New York shipyard, which was the, the largest industry in, in Camden, particularly during the war when they made uh, ships. This huge shipbuilding complex. Uh, the whole neighborhood left. The church was kept. The church was originally a Ukrainian Catholic church. It's now a Baptist church. The sidewalks are all, you know, impassable. You can't walk the sidewalk. So people walk through the middle of the streets. The churches that were built by the, by the old immigrant communities are still standing, like that one. But that one just recently lost the cross. One day the cross came tumbling down, and it's a huge church, so you can imagine that that cross uh, must have caused some commotion when it came down. Areas like this are selected for a certain type of billboards that you see all over uh, the neighborhood. And it's billboards like this that you don't put in any other neighborhood except the poorest neighborhoods in America. This, I saw this billboard in Newark too, because it was a New Jersey billboard. That one too. And that's the most recent one. Uh, it's, it's sort of ironic because you look at it and, uh, and it talks about paying and helping the children. And, and, and it's literally in a place where uh, you know, the, the idea of money, it's such, uh, it's such a rarity. So, again, that's a police raid in a block. It's what happens. I remember in New York during the heyday of the uh, of, uh, crack, you know, back in 81 or 82, uh, people used to storm a building. They would just, uh, they, the, the police and the state police and sometimes the FBI would come in and they would seal a building and then go like 200 at the time into the building and people compare them to a sort of an earthquake or something. And this is in Camden uh, where the, the block is sealed, the vans are all lined up, you see two or three lined up. Uh, a vans line up and then people who have uh, uh, a, 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 an arrest warrant uh, on their name uh, are then taken on the vans and then taken to prison from there. That was a picture that I just happened to walk into looking for a higher point of view. I went into the second floor of an abandoned house and there she was. Uh, my first impression was that she was dead, and then I just went to get the cops and say, and actually she wasn't dead. Uh, the memorials, you know, which had the reflection of this violence, I mean, there's always a new crop of memorials. And in this case, a stop sign becomes a memorial, this is on Broadway. Uh, in here, it's four of the local boys that. Uh, that, uh, you know, they become sort of towering figures in the neighborhood. And the fact that they were memorialized in this way so infuriated the local Catholic priest that he came with paint and roller and painted over this, uh, this uh, figures. And at the same time, a whole group of drug dealers from North Camden came to scream at him while he was painting over this. That's a more recent one from uh, East Camden. And this is one that it's almost like a, the masterpiece of the genre. It was, it was uh, featured in the New York Times about a year ago. And uh, the reporter and the 
and the police and a policeman agreed that this was sort of a, a gem of a mural, but at the same time they said, well, it has to go, you know, because it glorifies the trade. That's another one. And that then the city has all the signs that have been left. You know, from the times when when Camden was a city like any like most like many other cities in America, and there are signs like this. This is a store that, for some reason, still see, is functioning. But many of the other ones uh, are have disappeared, and they have left their signs there. Some of the companies and some of the logos have disappeared. Uh, that's Christopher Columbus that was put in a, in a city park by the Italian community. And then there are the signs of the old, of, of you know, the, that connect, that tells, you know, we were once a great city, we, were, we had great bridges, we had great buildings. And that's the uh, Ben Franklin Bridge. That's one of the piers of the Ben Franklin Bridge that says Camden. That's the house where Walt Whitman lived back in 1984. You can see it had an abandoned house right next to it, and it had a vacant uh, one that was a crumbling, crumbling ruin and another vacant house that was later fixed. And later, across the street from the Walt Whitman house, they put the <coughs> Yes, the Camden County Jail. So it's sort of, it's, it's, it, it, one can't help thinking, you know, of what would uh, Walt Whitman have written if he was still around. That's where he's buried in the cemetery. And surprisingly, his mausoleum is one of the buildings that has changed the least. But his intention from the very beginning was to build, build something really rugged and rough that would last for forever. In, in, in 1976, during the bicentennial, there was a debate in Camden. And I'm the reporter of that debate. The debate was, should we join the bicentennial? And they, it went back and forth between the, the teenagers and, 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 and they said, uh, what, it, what was there for us to, what's there for us to cheer about the bicentennial? We still were slaves for another hundred years. And then at the same time, the city of Philadelphia was preparing itself for a great uh, celebration. They had the tall ships coming and they had the, the fireworks. So that spirit of celebration got into the students, uh, the, high, the high school students, and uh, the city gave them some paint, and they started putting a series of motifs that are very crude, but to me this is very revealing and very moving. So you see some, some the, the, the date 1776, the horses, you know, they, some, some pictures of Indian maidens there, and then some African American fighters, you know, fighting during the Revolutionary War, an eagle that got eroded there. <laughs> and here you have the the uh, the African American worker, and at the same time the civ famous civil rights photograph there uh, that has been superimposed. And that's a detail. <coughs> And that's all there is left of that. It's, uh, it's the old flag. This is another one of the photographs that was found in the, that was taken in the same factory where the first picture was. And I think it's a play with the, with the Statue of Liberty. Some buildings stay, and I, I think this is what the, this is one of the things that I find very interesting is uh, it's a few people managed to make the transition as the city made the transition they stay there with their businesses in this case it was uh, a, a couple that had that bar 
but they continue having that bar uh, even though the neighborhood around them changed completely. So even though it was a white neighborhood of Poles and Ukrainians and, and uh, Irish, it, uh, it changed into an African-American neighborhood. But they were there, and the, the business continued to thrive, and everything around them sort of disappeared. So here is this bar, one of the strangest bars in America, that is in the middle of nowhere, and it has, uh, sometimes you find around it almost a whole lifestyle being built. If you go a summer day, you find people barbecuing all around there, as if it was a city park. If you go in the winter, you find people selling such things as socks and, and, and cigarettes and so on. So another one of the things that it's left behind that stay there, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's a store in Camden. And that is a place that sells religious objects, most to, mostly to a Latino, uh, uh, would you say, to a Latino clientele. That's part of the eroded cityscape. That's what, you know, what it's, it's, some of the streets, or many of the streets of the city look like today. A, a house that has been sealed there and sort of preserved standing, uh, almost blinded. One house, and here is something that, uh, that I, I do want to do, uh, uh, follow through this. Uh, what happens when there is one house that is either attached to a house that is abandoned, or where, like in this case, is attached to several houses that are abandoned? Does it, how long does it continue? What happens to the people inside? How do they perceive their situation? What, what is, uh, uh, you know, if I go there next year, if I go there the year after, will will they still be there? Will they sell the house and give it, you know, to somebody else? Again, here is one that is occupied and is tied up to all those other houses that are scheduled to be demolished. You can see the sign there for demolition. Those are houses that will go very soon. Part of the reason why so many houses in this particular area are going is because the land itself was polluted there. Much of that industrialization, that, that heavy industry that took place, that was there and thrived, uh, polluted the land. And uh, depending on what the pollutants are, sometimes that can take seven years, sometimes longer than seven years to clean. Uh, and it's really a major undertaking. So this area is all going to be cleared and I, I, you know, the cleanup period is going to start. The houses start peeling, you know, so the different, the, this is the sense, you get the same sense in Detroit, in many of the other American cities. And then you start getting the older, the older uh, skins. You know, I think of this almost as, a, you know, having an x-ray of the, <laughs> of the house where, you, you almost can date, you can date all those skins, you know, you know when aluminum siding came, you know, when, when this, this other asbestos siding or, you know, all the different sidings that, uh, that were around in the 30s or the 20s. That is the case of a woman that had to live with a house, with a vacant house next to her. And she had done so for seven years, and in seven years, uh, the house was still vacant. That's the house, the house next door had recently been vacated. An elderly lady lived there, and she got too old, and she had to go to a hospice. And, uh, of course, the house was burnt, but the next door, they continue to live there, even though it's wide open. A similar situation here and here. I, I I don't have much to say about this. I just, I mean, the man he has a job. He goes out to the clean hotels in 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 the 
surrounding areas of the city and then he comes home and this is his home and he's uh, doing some cleanup and some painting efforts that go just part of the facade. That's another example. The institutions too pass a certain point uh, up to a certain point, there were like the institutions anywhere in America, and then they, then they began to be built in a styles that were only adapted for the inner city. And this is a case of a school. Uh, you know, I'm sure <laughs> that, that if you go to uh, some other cities, you know, that are more affluent, you won't see schools that look like this. And, and the irony, of course, is that the schools put this big flag there. That's another example of a school in Camden. Some of them may have been adapted. It may have been that the style, uh, it's a style that was built in the 60s when they still thought that maybe this situation was not going to be permanent and then they put those metal cages on the windows afterwards. That's a sign from another one of the schools. That's a daycare center, also from Camden. And that, those are the leftovers of industri industrialism. I was a smokestack that was, uh, it's been demolished since then. The house is not there. It's a picture back in 1982. The interior of a factory that's first used to it was a chemical plant, and then later is used to store materials, and then uh, that that's taken down. And, and uh, what they do is they use it as for paper recycling. The top of buildings are used as antennas, you know, to keep cell phones going. And and this was uh, this drum antennas that are not used anymore, not not in use anymore, but now. You don't take them down, so they stay there. There's this sort of cumulative uh, sense where you take layers of you take layers of antennas, so you go into the different type of antennas today. Uh, but the old is left there. That's an extraordinary sign. Uh, it's insofar as you're trying to sell some property, and it seems to me that it's more to discourage people from buying it. Uh, it's, uh, it's in an area that is polluted, and finally the homeowners had to, had to make a deal with the city and sell, and uh, uh, this is what the blocks were like. That's a view of one of the houses not far. And uh, also in, in this is a uh, combination between what is left there and stays there, you know, like the drums in the building that we saw before, the boat that gets there that somebody back 20 years ago thought, well, I'll buy this boat, it's cheap, on my spare time I'll fix it, and then it stays there because once he got it there, it was vandalized and he realized that it was going to be much harder to fix it, but yet it stays there. Gas stations, this is a whole street that was closed, you know, because the whole street was contaminated. There's just one house that's still occupied there. And the trees, too, you begin to think this is probably the most uh, beautiful, these are probably the most beautiful trees in the street, uh, in the city. They make a canopy over the street, and uh, uh, the, all the houses are going to be clear from there, and I don't know if. If, if the contamination affects the trees too, so that the trees will be uh, demolished too. That was the old, uh, the old Carnegie Library, the Camden Free Public Library that was put there in 1904. And then uh, it was abandoned and it had trees growing inside. And there you get a sense of the sort of elegance that was there in that library. That's what it looks like today, as the, there's a plan to refurbish the library and uh, uh, put it to use again, you know, if, if, if it doesn't crumble altogether. 
there are fields that are full of the machinery that was used, you know, in the heydays of Camden. You can almost study a history of old machinery just by going to the junkyards of Camden. And this is uh, this claws are part of, of, of I believe, of a crane. The city that used to make chips now t t it takes them apart and then the metal from the ships is uh, exported to China where it's used to build new products. That's another one. Camden has these huge areas that were one industrial areas. Now they have full, they're, they're junkyards. So uh, the city has become not only uh, the, the, the transition has been from production to to this uh, to junkyards, but uh, uh, also uh, prisons have been built in Camden. There have been two large prisons, and in addition to that, there's been uh, Camden has become the place where the sewer the sewage from the suburbs is treated. So in some of these neighborhoods, as you know, the, particularly the one where you saw the sign before, if you go around, uh, the smell is almost unbearable sometimes. See, this is a truck, you know, with the the uh, all refrigerators and the, the like are being taken to one of the junkyards. That's the prison. That's the the state prison. Not to say that there is not a, 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 it's still some some uh, uh, sort of everyday normal life. I mean, there is a police athletic league, and the kids are uh, play soccer there in the fields. Uh, there are places like this trailer park, which to me was uh, extraordinary because it was the only place where I saw probably a hundred or more than a hundred units, none of which was abandoned. So here, the trailer park, which usually is used to, you know, to despair a neighborhood, says it's, a, it's somebody from a trailer park, was the good neighborhood. That's a Hope Six project in Camden. You know, the old projects that were demolished. And near the waterfront, near the Delaware River, and very close to downtown Philadelphia, a number of buildings, some of them historic buildings, are being fixed uh, through a recovery program that put something on the order of $170 million from the state to be used to do such things as an, an aquarium, an expansion of the aquarium, some industrial parks, a, a center for performing arts, and so on. And this building that was then fixed, this was uh, the headquarters of uh, RCA for, in Camden. A building famous because it had the logo of the company on the top of the tower. And then it was allowed to deteriorate, but then it was fixed, and the, the, with fifty million dollars of government help. And now it's a success because the trip to Philadelphia takes ten, fifteen minutes to downtown Philadelphia, and there's there's like a security cordon around. <coughs> it's like recreating. It's like creating a wall, two cities separated by a wall. That's the aquarium, the entrance to the aquarium, which is now run privately, was built and paid with public funds. On the edges of Camden, you see some immigrant, an immigrant presence, as you see, uh, in this case, you see Vietnamese people and they have a couple of Vietnamese restaurants as well as uh, pag a pagoda and several businesses. Also Mexicans are starting to come to Camden and this is also in the periphery and this is one of the restaurants. 
And this is uh, the, the, so what I'm trying to show that some of the elements of recovery, you know, have to do with the presence of the immigrants that are coming in. At the same time, you have the other recovery, which is the state-sponsored recovery, which is creating this separate section of Camden, and which brought, among other things, the battleship New, Year, New Jersey, which you see there, uh, and uh, the city of Camden bid for it, and they finally got it, and that, it's the idea is that it attracts visitors and keeps the city, you know, the visitors will spend money there and that will keep the city alive. So, uh, I'm very glad to have uh, spoken here. I hope that this was of interest to you and that you have many questions. And uh, I hope I'm able to answer them. I'm particularly happy to see my friend Keon Park here, with whom we go a long way. And uh, we work together in Detroit. And we did a show on storefront of art and architecture in New York, which he used to run. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy that my friend Anne brought me here and be able to talk to you. So let's. Uh, Let's see if, uh, if you have some questions, and uh, let's have a discussion. Go ahead, Larry. The power of your narrative on Camden is really quite immense. And though what you presented tonight was, in the end, balanced by some of the more positive things, it would have the overall effect of documenting decline of the city. And my question is, do you want your work to be perceived that way, uh, as opposed to uh, photographing the city in terms of its coping mechanisms and the efforts that, that people have? Um, given that photography is such an important way to image and re-image places mm. to those of who, who don't visit. Yes. Um, does it concern you that people would come away from your work uh, feeling more despair about Camden uh, rather than uh, looking at those images that you saw towards the end? And what, what is the role of, of a photographer uh, in caring about the future of a place? Um, when the story is in part one of destruction and decline? Well, I think it's a fair question, and it's a question that I've been thinking about for a long time. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, that's why I preceded my presentation by quoting that, uh, that uh, survey of uh, historians and planners. And by quoting the, 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 by starting with the idea of the permanent condition, I think, I think that the main, uh, the main role of somebody that it's to see and report uh, has to be to do that in a form that is as complete as possible. And if nobody else is going to report this mechanism of survival, of surviving, which are often mechanism of decline, because you know, what if in the case of uh, of the Packard plant that used to make uh, automobile automobiles and used to make uh, uh, engines for planes and so on, you come one day and uh, and they have fifty or sixty different uh, outfits. Uh, one of which uh, has all shoes to export to some <laughs> to some place in the third world. Another one has cardboard. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, a downgrading of function there. And I, it seems to me also that some of the ways in which we've gone about, uh, you know, trying to get the capital, the force, the vitality back into the cities have not worked and are not working now. And the people who keep on talking about the metropolitan area, they should be a metropolitan area. I mean, you know, you don't see any, any eagerness in the suburbs to say, look, I'm going to share my wealth with you. You know, sure, taxes will help to pay something 
you know, for, will help to pay for better schools for Camden or something or other. Uh, you know, because if you do the, the, the math, you realize that the metropolitan areas and all of these areas, is, 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 they're very affluent. And, and it wouldn't take very much to, to improve significantly the conditions of, of, of Camden. Yet the moment you start hearing the politicians there, you know, the way they defend their money, their turf, the way they don't want higher taxes, you don't imagine that that is ever going to happen. So then what are you left with? Well, what you're left with, it's, it's a powerful weapon, which is the internet. And then you sort of have to go into forums like this and say, look, you know, look at my website, you know. And, and the hope is that somehow, uh, you know, it may not be, to, you know, it may move someone that it, it, it's not from the immediate area, it's not from the metropolitan area, it's not from across the, the river from Camden, but it may be from thousands of miles away and say, look, you know, there may be something I can do in this city. I mean, uh, in some ways you did it. Uh, Kyung, you went to Detroit and you were there and you tried to start something in Detroit. And uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess <laughs> there is a new crop of human beings here. You know, they're 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 in their twenties and and they they're from all over and and they may some of them may see uh, their future or part of their future involved in places like this for whatever reason. I mean, I, because you know. One way to introduce them to to these places is through the images. Whether that's going to work or not, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, of course, uh, of course, it's 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 kind of a wild uh, uh, statement, you know, to say, to you know, sort of not very realistic. But then again, what else is there? What would you know? What's your view? What do you see the future of this place is like? Do you, th you think Gary is going to get any better? Detroit? I, I, within the next five years, let's say, or ten no, years. No. I guess the only, the only question is whether if, if part of the goal is to attract people to care about the places, hmm? how does one reconcile the most powerful and well-disseminated images being more about the story of the decline, albeit with a fair amount of coping mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, versus the uh, the attempts to focus on uh, the the efforts by local community groups or other other efforts to uh, reinvest in the places. Um, and do, do you feel that that by becoming the self-appointed documenter of the city? in a way that goes beyond what, what others there are, mm. are able to do by the virtue of the quality and dissemination of your work. Um, are you moving that city in the direction that you'd like it to be? Uh, or, or does it run the risk of scaring people off uh, from investment in, in they, the they already are, Larry. They already are. They are out of it. They are not, the money that's coming in, it's, it's government money. There is a company called Cherokee that wants to tear down and, 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 uh, and get uh, a thousand people out of their homes and build 5,000 homes, but it's a program, you know, I mean, every, every year it gets postponed, one more year, one more year, and we don't know what the impact of that's going to be. I mean, to sort of create that ribbon, by the waterfront that is separated from the sort of core inner city place. I realize it's a tough question, and I don't have an answer for you. But uh, but uh, but on the other hand, I mean, somebody has to tell the story of the sort of sort of nitty gritty of decline. You know, the story of what it's like if you have your home, if you clean your front yard, if you put your plants there. But you still have an abandoned house next door to it, and you still live with the fear that that's going to catch on fire and burn your place, and you probably can't stay, can't sleep very well at night. I mean, that's that. 
you see whether it, it's the, the whole idea of being able to do something which is perfectly balanced is uh, it's uh, it, it's of course enrichable and and you know for one person is it's a very difficult one. So in thirty years of photographing Hampton, there's never been a case where that one inhabited house next to the abandoned one has been followed by a rehabilitation of the one next door. I'm sure it has happened. I'm sure it has happened. But you see. What happens, and I think this is, this, is, this is when you use images as a source of discovery, is that you discover the questions too. And it, I tell you, it took me 29 years to realize that this is a way in which a problem was being posed in a very stark way. And that it could be, it, it, could, it, 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 it can be done, that someone can do a very beautiful piece of research because the places are there, the addresses are there, and then we would find out the answers to what you're saying. My job is kind of put it in front, you know, here. This is, this is one, one thing. I think that also restores the dignity to the people who are still there and holding out. You know, I mean, most of us would have left. But all I'm asking is whether you did ever find the case where those people who are holding out were rewarded by, by reinvestment next door yeah. as opposed to the building falling down. Well, I guess my answer in a roundabout way is that I've been slowly trying to get to the usefulness of this approach. You know, rather than first you look for an impressionistic way and say, look, this gives you an impression of what this is. And then you start doing the systematic way. And now the, the, this, this pairs struck me as being something very powerful about a year and a half ago. So I'm sure enough the next time I go to Camden I'm going back to all those addresses. I have about 20 addresses or more than that and then I will know some of the story. But you see this I'm trying to invent a research tool uh, all by myself. And I'm not. Great set of examples to work with. But can I ask a gentleman a question to him? Uh, why are you? Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to get to, but maybe I could ask the question, turn it around the other way, and say, uh, what you, do you think is it better not to photograph and present? Oh, no, 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 no not, not at all. I just How what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to understand is what is the, the, the you know is the is it all in one direction or is there a selection in what is what is documented that is meant to to uh, tell the story of decline and what happens to a photographer that is confronted with. Uh, contradictory evidence mm. uh, about some things moving in one direction and some things going the other. It's no problem but the contradictory mm, yeah. material yeah. because yeah. it does go yeah. Yeah. down yeah. And, and the other way. Yeah. You know. Let me jump in on this sure. because I, I think that to me um, the most poignant images that, among the most poignant images that Camilla showed are these recent ones of these pairs of houses. Mm. Uh, where someone is caring for a place in the face of all of this devastation around them. And this is, these are recent photographs, and essentially what the question that I want to ask Camillo is to describe a little bit about how you choose the places where you photograph, because he th I think you must think very deliberately mm -hmm. from the beginning about where to go. So don't forget, he started 30 years, 30 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Started 30 years ago, he had to make uh, some decisions. And so, where? How did you decide where to go? And then, how did you? Did you then branch out after a while and start finding other things like mm -hmm. these pairs of houses? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you start because you want to show what extreme poverty and the environment of extreme poverty in the United States urban poverty it's like so you you figure it's like Jacob Rees so Jacob Rees goes and photographs the the lodging houses 
the apartments where people do peace work, where entire families live in one room, the alleys where the bandits are, the, the child labor, all of those things. The difference is that Jacob Rees thought that he, through his images, could bring change and could bring the abolition of, the, of types of buildings, of overcrowding, uh, that create sanitary conditions, create a healthy environment. The difference is that we've, been, we've seen these situations in some ways get worse over a period that by now I, I take it to be about 50 years. So it seems to me that the strongest representation that you can make of this thing the, the sense, and I'm really, you know, I mean, I think you and I are sort of past, you know, the, the, the you know, and I think I, I'm addressing the 20 year olds. I'm addressing the 15 year olds, if I could. I mean, if I have to go, I said, look, this is here. They, they tell you, this is your country. They tell you this is going to be permanent, that it's going to be here for the rest of the time you'll be, uh, you'll be alive. Do you think it's right? I mean, I don't say that thing. I will never, you'll never catch me saying it unless you kind of press me. But I think that, it's my hope, that that is going to get some sort of a response. You know, and maybe not, you know, maybe not. I don't know. Let me just get one more and then you can. Go ahead. There was an exhibit uh, last year in Berlin on shrinking cities. Yeah. And they documented 500 cities that were in decline, post-industrial mm. cities. So it seems to me that it's a global phenomenon, that it's part of advanced capitalism, and yes. something that's happening throughout the world. And I don't know whether there's a clear analysis of that. Part of the exhibit, though, had similarities to what you've been doing, in that it was, it was almost like an archaeology of decline. Yes. So you saw the effects. You didn't see the response. So it left you feeling, you know, not quite clear about the direction to take. So I guess there's this issue, which is what I guess Larry was raising here, of the, the degree to which your images promote struggle and a sense that you can respond on different levels versus a sense that, 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 that this is something that's beyond you and you best find your way outside of places like Campton because it's a very difficult struggle. So that's one observation. The other is that there really is this you know, effort with the Ford Foundation and the city mm. and the state and the reinvestment fund and others to try and do something there. But you don't really have an honest dialogue about the effects of that, those kinds of efforts. What's really working? What isn't working? What have you learned? All of that. So in the places like Camden and like I think there's Sandtown, Winchester, and Baltimore, where, they've, where there's been this big effort to turn around a really distressed place, you don't really see what exactly has worked. Um, so that's a little bit, you know, in terms of those of us who want to do something about this are always kind of left feeling that there's a, um, that there's a big thing here to be dealt with, but the lessons learned are not necessarily drawn out. Mm -hmm. And I think you've documented what, what in fact happens if nothing is done, but you leave open whether or not anything can be done. Oh, well, I think that's fair, and I, I, what I find, what, what interests me is to try to the utmost to make the places understandable. In other words, I think what you say, and Kyung was involved with the Berlin project, uh, you know, I think having an involvement with a place of 26 years allows you to be able to follow certain stories and those stories will make people relate 
to the place. I mean, the stories sometimes may not be uh, stories of great achievement. You know, just putting a few paintings on on a on a block or two of Broadway in Camden may not amount to very much, but it's certainly illuminating in terms of what was like to be a teenager growing up in Camden and how do you respond to this situation of obviously living in, a con in conditions of extreme uh, uh, poverty across the river from what looks to you like a thriving center city. So it's, it's, it's how do you relate to it? You see, to me, the great, uh, the great problem with this city is, you know, and I think it's just as true of Gary in the end. I mean, I think Detroit has gotten some interest, uh, but there are many other cities too that have like walls around them so that what happens there just doesn't count. It doesn't make it. It's not there. It's not in the books. So, so it's, it's, it's that vacuum that with whatever I can do that I want to fill up. I want to say, you know, look, you know, this, 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 this building is from a time when Camden was like any other city in America, you know, when it was quote unquote normal, you know, but then things like this happen as the time progressed. And of course, there are reasons for that. And there's much more than what I can say that other people can say. But I'm all making a pitch. I'm also saying, and I'm glad to do it here, that this is a legitimate course of study. And I'm happy that for the first time, people like Tom Sugru and Howard Gillette and Robert Self are taking this places and are writing monographs, you know, about Oakland, about Detroit, about uh, uh, Camden, New Jersey. And they will be part, there will be something that you cannot put a wall around because we're very good at putting walls around things. I'm sorry. You, you like to, let me just. I love, and I'm also a photographer. Yeah. And um, I've done several cities. And um, I've definitely agree with you of the importance of being able to um, see the marks of the city over a period of time. It's not yeah. something that can be done overnight. People want to do it as a complete dedication. Yeah. It took me 15, I've been in the city for 15 years. I've been in Berlin for 10 years. So, um, and, and what's happening is not only that we're seeing the decay of cities, but we're also seeing the booming of cities. Yes. I mean, we speak just 14 cities been born in China with 4 million people as it is. Oh, sure. Five years. And so it's, it's a marks of immigration, it's a marks of culture, it's a marks of and, and, and that's what they were photographing, whether it's poor, it's rich, it's wealthy, it's a suburban, or it's an imploding neighborhood, whatever it is, it's just a mark. And you should be photographed and be taken for what it is. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You want to say something? Um, during this period of time, did you really uh, sense that the decay happened at different rates as it went along? Was it one period where it just really hit? And and also, it's that coincided with other cities uh, across yeah. the country. So it was really a, a moment in time where this really took off. And you feel like now that it's sort of uh, in remission a bit, or it's slowing down as far as the rate of decay. Mm -hmm. Well, Kim, I'm sorry, I haven't seen him for several years. Yeah. <laughs> <There's another laughs> Uh, yes, you know, I think I think the period of the crack epidemic was one when you saw change happen very fast and buildings going up in flame and so on uh, and so uh, I don't know. Sometimes I get that sense, you know, like that block has gotten the form, you know, maybe the new form, you know, of the of the repair repair corner for for people, you know, with the pizza place and the, and the shelter for battered women and the shelter and the, you know, the methadone clinic and, you know, sort of the, the new uh, commercial block, you know, the new form of the commercial block, you feel that at one, at one point that that is, maybe it's going to be like that for the next 10 years. 
Now, one thing that I didn't say at the beginning, and I would, I know that somebody asked the question, how do I pick uh, what I pick? Well, I pick all tall points of view that I can get access to. So if there is a bridge, I go up the bridge and photograph from the bridge. If there is a tall building, I go up and photograph from the tall building. I also do the major commercial street with a lot of care because I know the importance of those streets. So I do it uh, almost systematically, you know, every block, at least one picture, two or three, and try to stay with that. In the case of Camden, I did the street that had the, and, 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 this, and this was sort of insane when I think of it, that the, the street where the drug trade was the, the most intense, and that was Bailey Street. So you have a site, if you click on the Bailey Street, you see where the really, a, a, a street that had a very heavy drug traffic was like. Uh, in addition to that, I, tr I try, I, I either drive around or walk around most blocks, most neighborhoods, most alleys, uh, go in, try to go inside wherever I can go inside. If I can go inside factories, if the factories are open, if they will let me go in, I'll go in. So uh, once you start putting the dots on the map, you know, you get a sense right away of where, where you, you know, what your covering and what you're leaving out. To me, it's also very important, the, and, and this, I think, it's, a, it's, you see, when you take the sort of pro, pro, propagandist uh, photographer, you know, let's take, and, and I say it with admiration, let's take Lewis Hine that said, let's abolish child labor. You know, and what do you need to abolish child labor? Well, you show the injustice of it. You show children and the machines where they work. You look at those pictures and you think, this is terrible. This should not happen. We don't need this to happen. We don't need these kids to be doing this. We need them in school. We need them, you know, getting a health, healthy air and exercise and all of those things. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't see anything else that those kids did. You don't see, you don't, you don't have any idea of what they sang, if they sang anything. You don't have any idea what their homes look like. You don't have any idea if they made any drawings or anything. That's why the drawings, the art, the, the forms that are created by the local residents are so important to me. You know, that's what the, those memorial walls that I show are so important to me because they are the product, they, 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 you know, they reflect the spirit of, of, of people who do live there. And, uh, uh, you know, so that's, that's that, 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 it's building over time. Take care, have a good day. And, uh, and uh, you know, those, those are the basic things that I try to do when I, when I photograph a city. Uh, I'm sorry, you, <laughs> go ahead. I see your work very much as being a witness and a taxonomist of a certain class of cities in the U.S. And, and you've done this for you know, about three decades. Yes. Leaving those two roles aside, or, or otherwise sort of collecting from your experience in those shoes, what insight can you give us or what have you learned about you know, what cities are and what their cycles are? And, where their resilience or lack thereof and, and their hopes could be. <laughs> that's, a, that's a difficult one. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, the, <laughs> people think that the best thing to do, I mean, the, the, this I've heard from, I'm sure you also have heard it, you know, that the best thing that people in Camden or in Gary could do is just pack up and go somewhere else. You know, it's now they're saying it about New Orleans. Uh, of course, they are out. Uh, and, uh, you know, is there a point where cities actually become a liability for the people who live there? I mean, it's a, it's a heavy question. You know, we always thought that cities were such a positive thing. You know, that, that, that cities, the crowning glory of, 
of, of civilization. It's, it's the place where the mind can function, you know, most, uh, with most intensity, with, uh, you know, human beings become engaged and then see them you know, really as, as dead places, you know, places where it should, you should uh, encourage. But then, you know, the other problem really is, 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 uh, is that we have no place for the people who live there, even if they wanted to get out of there. Where would they go? You know, can you, you, you imagine the whole, all the set of problems if they went to the more affluent South Jersey suburbs, you know, people who live in Camden and said, look, we're here, we're willing to move out of Camden. What, uh, what would happen? Uh, I don't know if, if, if they said all answers your question, but, but it's, uh, it's, an important, it's an important question and it's important to think. And I think, to me, I mean, I think as long as you can keep your mind interested and focused into different aspects of this city, as long as you can keep that, this, that the process, that the changes, engage you as, 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 you know, either by going to the website or by being able to read it in the city itself, you know, there is, there is, there is a possibility. I think the, the, the really dark, <laughs> you know, hopeless, you know, moment is when you say, well, there's, there's nothing here. There's nothing, you know, not even, not even the stuff that may interest you because, uh, it's quirky or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Um, I have a question about how you take pictures of the places you take pictures of. And one of the things that I noticed tonight was that um, and in one of, your, one of your responses to the questions, you mentioned it, um, and I, I won't rephrase it exactly right, but basically saying that you're not interested in events per se but in longer term changes over time and so I wonder and some but some of the stories that you told talk about things that happen in those places so yeah. I wonder when you when you're when you're in Camden um, whether you take photos of political rallies or church services or parades or um, the police arresting someone or you know the kinds of yeah. images that we think of as like the photojournalist image that goes up on the, the front page of the newspaper or shows up on the evening news or or the document a story of a of a community of people you know a par an ethnic pride parade or a, the MLK day parade or things yeah. like that so my question is are those um, events that you attend but you but you're interested in, in showing other kinds of um, views of the, the built environment of the city um, or are those images that you take but then when you edit and you decide the story that you want to tell those are ones that you tend to leave aside and instead focus on the slower pace of change in the built environment well a, a policy that I consciously took from the beginning of the, my documentation was to sort of leave to others what others were already doing so since I lived in New York, there was plenty of poverty in the Lower East Side, but there were plenty of photographers that were photographing the Lower East Side. Why do you want another one? You know. So there are plenty of photographers that do those rallies, that do those festivities and so on. They don't do the, you know, the sort of drug, or they may do it too, you know, they, 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 you know when they cordon off a block, like the picture that I show you, or the picture, of a drug addict on the floor, on the floor, which you know, I you could tell me that 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 was an extreme abuse of privacy, which it was. But uh, but but uh, I don't have. Um, <clears throat> how can I say it? It's uh, <laughs> there is a division of labor. I mean, those those newspapers do take those photographs constantly, and they usually give them to the university. So Rutgers Camden at one time will get all the files from the Courier Post and they will have the 80,000 pictures or 100,000 pictures and they will get a big write-off for taxes and, and they will have a huge number of photographs of precisely those things. I don't know how well 
uh, how can I say, identify they will be. I mean, mine are, you know, I made sure that they are very well identified by place and time. And if there is anything else to, to add there, I, I, I put it there. And if there is anyone to ask any question about what's happening, I ask there. But that's, that's the reason why you don't have those, uh, those photographs there. I figure if that's going on, I mean, I, 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 you see, it's, there's a basic idea, idea here. The first time I spoke as a documentary photo photographer uh, ever, was at the city museum of the city of New York. And I show similar pictures of this, mostly from the Bronx. And some of my students said, you call yourself a documentary photographer. You show us a bunch of pictures of buildings. He says, what, what is this? And uh, uh, well, now the answer is uh, the buildings speak for people. You know, you can see the hand of not just of time, and, but also the hand of people in the way the environment changes. We just have to learn to read it. Go ahead. I wanted to ask, are there any other northeastern cities that you might parallel to the north? And if so, in you know, what cities are they? And have you seen, how many parallels have you seen? Because to me, Camden almost seems more like one of the Midwestern cities. Yeah. Like it's, it's become isolated and it's, you know, if you look at Philadelphia and Baltimore like in the early 80s when there were just massive problems and such a huge part of the city was, you know, ghetto basically. You know, Camden's never, Philadelphia and Baltimore have started to come back and Philadelphia has really come back. But Camden is like this isolated place that it reminds me a lot more of Midwestern cities. East St. Louis really and so on. Well, you know, I, I, I think there are parts of Philadelphia where I feel like I'm just in Camden, you know, yeah. <laughs> in North Philadelphia and parts of West Philadelphia like that. Uh, I should have, could have shown you some pictures of uh, Philadelphia scenes. Um, yeah, Camden is extreme, and I think it's important because it's extreme, and I think it should be shown, you know, with as much, uh, uh, how can I say it? You know, it, it, they always told me not to use biological analogies or medical analogies, but if you wanted to show the case of, 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 of something that's present in the body, you know, you want to show it in its maximum expression, you know, where it's strongest, because there is what is where it's easier to understand. Uh, if you can do that, I mean, and 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 the United States doesn't have a lack of places like 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 I mean, I mean Benton Harbor is another. The big places, big parts of Chicago, and now there's a, a number of suburbs in the south side of Chicago that are very much like this, Robbins and and Harvey and so on and so forth. I mean, the list is, is long. So it's not, it's not like I'm singling the one, the one terrible place. And certainly Detroit is it's another story. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know to what extent. I don't think uh, Camden is the exception. Camden is, it's, it's, it's a, but I also think that through Camden, you know the whole theme, the whole the, this this story may become you know more poignant, more you know may get may draw people in because it's extreme. Go ahead. Um, your work so essentially has to do with deep time, and in that sense, it's it's sort of different from the instinct of photography to capture a moment, yeah. a great shot, yeah. or something like that. So my question is about when you choose to photograph. Really, over, over the last 26 years, of whether there is some significance to taking a picture in 79, and then in 88, if I'm correct, and 96, and so on. Do these points in time have some significance? And also, when you go to a place that are, uh, you talked about what you choose to photograph, but then is there a time of 
the month, the year, or even the time of day that you choose mm -hmm. to photograph at, yeah. as opposed to, so do you try to avoid something if you try to avoid events, which you already talked about, so you may not photograph them at events? Well, what, <laughs> I try to avoid the Chamber of Commerce. I, 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 I think you attribute too much to, uh, you know, to sort of will. You know, I mean, I'm, I don't have those choices. Uh, I started Camden because I had a chance to get a job for the state of New Jersey, and uh, I, I was working for the energy department, and I managed to convince them that, uh, that to create a position for me that would involve getting me to the most depressed cities in New Jersey. Because I sort of said, look, we don't have a presence in Camden, we don't have a presence in Patterson, we don't have a presence in Trenton. And so I had a state car and I had the possibility to organize meetings and so on in Camden, so I had a chance to photograph there. So I could only photograph when I had meetings there. You know, I couldn't just say, look, the weather looks perfect, now I'm going to, you know, go and, and, and take these pictures. And the years, uh, oftentimes there are many more pictures than what you saw there, but I just selected those because those shows change in a, in a, in a, in a more clear way. It's the, the, the choice, choice becomes a problem, you know, because uh, obviously, the people try to, they, they tell you all the time, you know, I mean, you're doing, you're, you're following your instincts, you're, you're expressing yourself, you know, you're, you're, you're doing, you're, you're recreating your own private personal history. And then you build the system to defeat that so that people can't say that because, you know, I don't put the tall buildings there. Somebody else put them there. And I, do, I pick the light in a way in which is not interesting light in terms of, you know, lights and shadows or angles that are really fancy, you know, but I take, I take pictures straight on. Because those are the ones that are easy, make it easy to read the building, to sort of duplicate the building, to give you a, 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 another a view of it. Uh, as far as... Uh, you know, uh, the using of time-lapse photographs. I mean, ever since the beginning, I had the feeling that the best way to proceed was not to think that one picture would tell the whole story because it was absurd. I knew that this was insane to try to take, you know, one picture of this building or one picture. Of, I, I thought it, from the beginning that this, pictures were like building blocks. And if you wanted to build something, you needed to take a whole lot of them and a whole lot of times. And then you get a sense of, of what was happening and, and, and could engage others in that. I think this is a good place to end and to thank you and also to remind folks to visit Camille Rivera's website, Invisible Cities. Dot com. It's really an extraordinary site in the way that it puts photographs and pre together and pre presents them not only in terms of time, but in terms of a fairly sophisticated mapping, uh, interactive, interactive mapping technique. So you can zoom around, find your way around Camden, and then go in and see a particular place at several different points in time. So, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and sharing not only your images with us, but your generosity in the last uh, hour answering questions and talking. Oh, I'm very happy. Thank you.